Lance Luce with us on the Barton Organ today, folks, and welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director. Welcome back, and best wishes to each of you for a good year this 2019. Uh, we're at the top of the winter season, and our new calendar is available in the lobby, so pick one up on your way out and make sure you don't miss a thing. Today we present the Barbara Lee Chief Curator from the Institute of Contemporary Art Boston, Ava Rispini. Ava's presence here today is a co-presentation uh, with the University of Michigan Museum of Art, fondly referred to as UMA, uh, as today's event occurs in tandem with the exhibition Art in the Age of the Internet 1989 to Today, which was curated by Ava uh, and is on view currently through April 7th at UMA. So if you've not seen the show, you must go see it. Uh, there's work in the show by past Penny Stamp speaker Rafael Lozano Hemmer, if that's not enough of a lure. Uh, and there is also uh, work by an upcoming speaker we have coming in February, Juliana Huxtable, uh, who's with us next month. Um, a big thank you to the museum who has, who has been and continues to be an extraordinary partner uh, for the series. Uh, another thing in tandem, with, in tandem with this exhibition I should tell you about this Saturday, the MF, MFA graduate students are having a symposium called Site Non-Site Website that uh, join the next generation of artists at their studio site as they explore theory and practice in the age of the internet. That's Saturday from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. and that's at the Stamp School Graduate Studios, which is way up far north at 1919 Green Road. Uh, more info on both the Stamp School website and UMA's website. On a personal note, for all of us here today, I want to acknowledge uh, a very significant event uh, which has transpired since last time we met. Uh, many of you, I am sure, have already heard this news, but for anyone who uh, is a regular series patron who has not yet heard it, it is with a heavy heart that I must inform you of the passing of Penny Stamps. Uh, she died uh, last month. Um, all of us here today, however, are very lucky as through her generosity, she has touched each one of us and even now she brings us here together today. Something Penny was very good at doing was bringing people together. And she loved this series uh, and even more she loved the opportunity uh, that she could afford us in opening opportunities for each and every one of us through this series. So we'll miss her presence among us very much uh, I had a couple photos. I was going to, here's Penny here in the theater with us as uh, she did, she did uh, come a couple times a year um, and she, she loved it uh, very much to be here with everybody. Uh, we'll miss her. She was an incredibly practical woman with a straightforward presence and indelible style and beauty and had a wonderful sense of humor and a great sense of diplomacy, but perhaps most of all, she had a deep sense of caring and a nurturing spirit uh, she was grace defined, I like to say. And here is another, ah, don't not work on me. Uh, this was a, once when Penny was here at the theater and just magically somehow that ended up being what was on the marquee that day, which seems very fitting. Uh, the good news for us all is that her generosity persists and we can all continue to enjoy the bounty of her legacy as we gather here each week in her name. Uh, another program uh, that we have to thank Penny for is the Roman Witt Artist in Residence Program, which was named for her father, Roman Witt. Uh, and we have just welcomed to campus uh, the 2019 Witt resident, Zhu Yun Kim, a Korean artist. She's here with us today. She is going to be in residence at the Stamp School throughout this semester, working on a multimedia installation in collaboration with the Stamp School community and composer George Sonsakis that explores themes around Korean comfort women, the abducted, abused, and raped female prisoners of the Japanese army during World War II. You can find out more about Zhu Young Kim and her project and opportunities to get involved next week, uh, as we are going to have a special event next Wednesday uh, at UMA in the Helmut Stern Auditorium. That'll be at 5.30 p.m., special Penny Stamp Series talk uh, by Zhu Young Kim. Um, and one more thing I wanted to add, uh, for anyone who didn't uh, know this news or have a chance, uh, Penny's obituary 
uh, is on the Stamp School website, and you should. She had many, many great works beyond the series here and the school in her name, and uh, it's, it's, it, I suggest you take a moment and do read about um, the amazing woman, Penny Stamps. Back to today, uh, the moment at hand, we are going to have a regular Q&A in the screening room, as per usual. If anyone doesn't know, go out the doors, turn left, and go down the hallway, and you will find yourself, there is another small theater there. The screening room will join you there directly after the talk in here. Uh, please do remember to turn off your cell phones. Nicola's Books is in the lobby. They have an amazing uh, big uh, coffee table book of the exhibition, Art in the Age of the Internet, out there for sale. Uh, and now for a proper introduction of our guest today, we have the woman at the helm of UMA. Please welcome University of Michigan Museum of Art Director, Tina Olson. Thank you, Christina. Good evening, everyone. I'm so very pleased to welcome Ava Raspini to the stage this evening. Ava is the Barbara Lee Chief Curator at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston and previously served as a curator at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I met Ava for the first time a year ago when I visited the ICA to see the show she had curated, Art in the Age of the Internet, which, as Christina mentioned, is now on view at UMA until April 7th, and I urge you to go see it, all of you. So I went to Boston to decide whether we should bring the show here. So I haven't known Ava long, but I have a long and close connection to her exhibition's topic, which is really all about the impact of the internet on art and artists over the past 30 years. I lived in San Francisco from 1992 to 97, as the World Wide Web was coming into being. It was like living through an earthquake, an amazing, disruptive, crazy time in which everything seemed to change at once. Friends began taking weird jobs no one understood, content producer, content strategist, interaction designer. We worried a lot then about how to write new kinds of non-linear text for CD-ROMs and websites. We didn't know who would look at these websites. So we began sending emails. We didn't know how to do that or when to do it versus picking up the phone. We had no mental model, no language, not the faintest idea of what we were doing. It was the Wild West, borderless, uncharted, exciting. Most artists I knew then had little interest in the World Wide Web, but a few did, and they began to experiment as they wondered what it was, a medium, a technology, a language, so I was thrilled when I learned of Ava's ambitious show. It felt to me like a critical story waiting to be researched and told and very, very long overdue. Now, Ava Rispini. Over the course of her career, she has specialized in global contemporary art and image-making practices. Most recently, she curated the show uh, at UMA, Art in the Age of the Internet, 1989 to today, which debuted at the ICA in early 2018. As I've mentioned, the exhibition examines the impact of technology in the, in the internet on visual art over the past three decades. It features 60 international and intergenerational artists with over 70 works spanning a variety of mediums. The show has been critically acclaimed and its impact was immediate and wide reaching. It allowed the ICA, for example, to collaborate with more than 14 arts organizations in greater Boston during its run. Ava's passion and commitment to contemporary art is contagious, and she has done a tremendous amount at the ICA in her three plus years there, expanding the permanent collection, curating shows such as a major retrospective of Cindy Sherman's work, and leading the opening of the ICA's Watershed, a 15,000 square foot industrial renovated space, offering a gallery, gathering spaces, and new and innovative programming. We are so excited to have this exhibition at UMA and in Ann Arbor and grateful for the opportunity to reach new audiences on campus and in the, and in the community with Ava's remarkable project. Please join me in welcoming her. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Tina and Christina, for those Warm welcome, thank you all for coming. I know it's a cold, snowy night, so it's great to see a full house. I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, it's a pretty big theater. Um, 
So tonight I'm gonna to talk about the exhibition Art in the Age of the Internet. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to see it yet. Um, if you haven't seen it yet, please do as soon as possible. But what I'll do tonight is give you an overview of the exhibition. I'll walk you through the exhibition. First, I'll talk about the kind of general ideas and parameters around the show, and then I'll focus on several artworks that will delve into depth. Um, I'll also talk about the process of putting together the exhibition, why I made the choices that I made, and at the end I'll reflect a little bit on the events and changing attitudes that have informed the exhibition and my thinking. So the internet is a huge subject. What do we mean when we talk about the internet? The internet is a physical thing. It's a set of cables, it's a set of wires, protocols that are operated by disparate software and hardware, but it's also a social and political construct. It's a set of social practices and exchanges that have wide-ranging and wide-reaching effect. The internet has fundamentally changed every facet of our lives, and I don't need to tell you that. It's, you know, it's changed how we consume information, how we conduct research, how we present our public and private selves, how we date how we shop, how we make friends, how we travel. It's transformed attitudes and mores. It's affected how societies see themselves and others and has challenged our perceptions, especially recently, of reality and the truth. So if the internet has radically changed every aspect of our lives, I think it's safe to say that it's changed art and visual production as well. It's changed how artists see, how they make, and how they think. This exhibition clearly features a lot of technology, but I would like to stress that this is an exhibition um, that's not of technology, but about technology. How technology has fundamentally changed our visual culture. And this is what we're really exploring in the internet, the internet as a social and political construct. In the exhibition, we see how all art, whether it's painting or moving images, sculpture, photography, websites, how all of this has radically been transformed by the cultural impact of the internet. The exploration of this cultural impact is why many of the works have absolutely no connection to technology in their form, but they nevertheless deal with issues that have been brought to the fore by the development of the internet and its wide-reaching effects. Exhibitions for me are essentially a series of questions, a set of propositions, if you will. And especially with thematic, you know, large group exhibitions such as this, there are no pat answers, but rather I see artists as leading us to a new way of thinking about certain questions and issues. Of course, there are many questions being asked in this exhibition, questions around how we understand our bodies and our sense of self in the digital age, about the circulation of information and images today, about the ethics of surveillance, just to name a few. But if I were to have to think about one question that this exhibition asks, and to kind of boil it down to that one question, it would be, how has the internet changed art? Now, of course, that's a huge question. It's a probing question. And the answer to that is varied and nuanced. Each artist is answering this in their own way, through their own lens, from their own perspective. And when I discuss the art in a minute, you'll see what I mean. You'll see the varied positions and ideas that are represented in this exhibition. So the story that we're telling is a global one. Over a dozen countries are represented in this exhibition. There's over 40 artists in the presentation here in Ann Arbor. It's also a story of multiple generations. Prescient thinkers are shown side by side with digital natives. And here is an instance uh, of a kind of face-off that we had in the Boston presentation of a piece by Nam June Pike with a piece by the collective How Do You Say Yam in African, which I'll talk about in a minute. And just one word about these uh, images that I'm showing you. These are all from the Boston presentation. So there may be some artworks that you see in here that didn't make it here because they're, um, the presentation here is a little smaller. But every artwork that I'll talk about in detail detail will be, um, is on view at UMA. So a, a big goal of this work is to contextualize the work that's being made today uh, with art from the past, 
art before Google, before social media, before smartphones, before e-commerce. And while technologies may have changed over the 30-year period that we're looking at in this exhibition, many of the concerns have remained the same. And you'll see that artists over several generations are investigating from their perspectives with the tools that they had available to them. And this is really a big part of the exhibition that there is a kind of multi-generational look um, at a single topic um, at hand. So the earliest uh, work in the exhibition is uh, dated 1989. It's a piece by Gretchen Bender, who's an amazing artist uh, that worked primarily in video. Um, she passed away. If you don't know her work, look into it. Um, I think she really is and was a prescient thinker. Um, so you might ask why 1989? Um, that is the year that the World Wide Web was introduced, and sometimes people confuse the World Wide Web with the Internet. So I'm going to digress and give a really short and simplified history of the Internet. Many of you probably know this history. The history of the Internet has been mythologized now quite a bit. Um, the Internet has been around since the 1960s, and it used to look something like this. It was mostly accessible to universities, certain governmental agencies, and it was not widely accessible to the general public. It was for specialists, for computer scientists, and other specialists. Then in 1989, the English computer scientist Tim Berners-Lee proposed a new model to access this internet while he was working at CERN in Geneva. And the idea was to create a hyperlinked system that connected these various sites. And as you can see in the note at the top of his proposal, it says, vague but exciting. And I think that pretty much sums it up. And this really became the World Wide Web. And he then made the architecture uh, of this system uh, widely available and free. And that's actually really key in how the internet as we understand it today really became widely accessible. Um, so soon, as Tina was telling us, there was a kind of ushering in of um, new web browsers that were user friendly. You didn't have to be a specialist or uh, a computer scientist to access the web. They looked something like this, Netscape and Mosaic um, were some of the first ones to come online. And then now I'm going to fast forward to what the internet looks like now, which you're all very familiar with. And this is a screenshot of myself and assistant curator Jeff DeBlois Skyping with Julia Shear, one of the artists in the show, another kind of prescient thinker, someone who's been working around issues of surveillance uh, really since the 1970s and early 80s. Um, and in fact, this is much of the way in which we conducted our research and conversations with many of the artists in the exhibition. And this is another way that the internet looks like now. So certainly this era of the web is familiar to all of us, and especially this kind of user-based guided content and social media seem to shape every aspect of our lives and how we understand ourselves and each other and the world. And that's really why the exhibition starts in 1989, because with the invention of the World Wide Web, this is the modern internet as we know it. And with the World Wide Web, arguably began the age of the internet in terms of its larger cultural impact. But just as crucial, 1989 also marked a seismic sociopolitical shift, an economic shift worldwide. The fall of the Berlin Wall, Tiananmen Square, the first satellite that comprised the GPS system was launched into space in that year. And these cultural events are arguably marked the beginning of our globalized era, which cannot be imagined without the internet. This socio-political shift is really just as important, or I would say even more important than the technological developments. Um, and this is really why we start the exhibition in 1989, which is when the internet really becomes larger in terms of its access to the public and its cultural impact. So hopefully this quick intro of the kind of parameters and, and ways in which we started to think about the exhibition gives you a sense of my thinking. Um, so now let's talk a little bit about the art. As a curator, for me, it always begins and ends with the art, and I'm so glad that most of you in the audience are artists or are makers. Um, I, hold, I hold what you all do in very high regard, and I have a tremendous amount of respect for what you do, because I know it's very difficult. Um, when I curate shows, I don't have an idea and then try and shoehorn art into that idea, but rather, in my work as a curator, I see a lot of art, uh, as much as possible, in person. Um, and artworks that stay with me or that sort of shift my thinking 
um, and shift my thinking around certain issues and ideas sometimes begin to coalesce into an exhibition. And that's really happened, is what happened with this exhibition. This exhibition has been taking shape in my mind for some time, but it was really my arrival in Boston in 2015 that was the catalyst to do this show. In many ways for me, Boston was the perfect place to launch the project, given how important technology is in Boston and the history of technology. Um, but also its presentation eventually in Boston, which was 2018, um, was almost 30 years after the invention of the World Wide Web. So that timing was also a moment to look back. There was enough perspective, enough time um, to really, really look back with, um, with maybe a little bit of authority as well. Like the internet, this exhibition is non-linear. We tell our stories over five thematic chapters or sections. And in each section, we include work by somewhere to six to eight artists, six to nine artists of all generations, working in all mediums from all over the world. And they're kind of, uh, as you'll see in the show, they're hung cheek to cheek, jowl to jowl. So there is this kind of sense, overwhelming sense um, of output, which I think is very much in the spirit of the internet or how we access the internet. Um, and the topics are varied. They go, they really are from ideas about threat to privacy or our sense of self and how that's been changed by the internet and social media. Now, each of these chapters could be exhibitions onto themselves, and in fact, there have been exhibitions all over the world on one or, or two of these sections. Um, and what we did was really ha select you know, the artists that we felt were the most salient and resonant, and that point to the various strategies of artists in the internet age. The thing to keep in mind here is that there is a porousness in these sections. We hope that the works will speak to each other and which, with each other within sections and across sections as well. And the way that the exhibition is installed here at UMA is really wonderful because it's very porous. So if you choose to follow the exhibition via section, which I'm gonna walk you through now, uh, section by section, that's great. But if you choose to meander and take your own path, there are these wonderful relationships that are made across the sections as well. And, and the installation here really accentuates that porousness. So the opening section of the exhibition is titled Networks of Circulation. When we think about the internet, I think one of the first things we think about is how the internet has ushered in an era of interconnectedness. The internet's global communications networks and related technologies have dramatically increased our collective output of data into a growing mass of information that we produce, circulate, and consume online at an extremely accelerated pace. The prevalence and portability of cameras, whether they're mobile cameras or police body cams, along with the increased presence of screens in public and private settings, have enabled and perhaps even caused us to share and be shared with as never before. Artists working with networked images and videos, those that are repeatedly uploaded, downloaded, shared, reformatted, re-edited, re-blogged, mobilize a range of artistic strategies. And together, the works in this section um, really reflect on the widespread social and political impact of our previously unimaginable level of access and interconnectivity. And many of the works in this section and in the exhibition at large address the kind of reality of the dream of the internet, which was a dream of sort of universal knowledge and universal interconnectedness, and really whether this dream has come to pass. Some of the artworks in the exhibition tackle the reality of what the internet has wrought today, standing from our position now in 2019. Most often, I would say, through a critical lens of where we stand in a post-truth, fake news world of internet echo chambers. So in, I'm going to talk about two works in each section. I, I've, I call these anchor works because these are works that really uh, were the first works I thought about as a, the show became kind of coalesced and works in each section kind of coalesced around these artworks that I'll talk about. So the first is a video installation by the French artist Camille Enroux. It's titled Gross Fatigue. And this is a work that I wanted to have in the exhibition from the very beginning. I saw it for the first time at the Venice Biennale in 2013 where it had its premiere. And its hypnotic score and images have really never left me. Gross Fatigue has been really an anchor of my thinking, not just of the show, but of my thinking through many ideas in the exhibition. And so with this work, the artist attempts to synthesize the origin stories of several cultures into a single narrative. 
She's essentially doing a narration of the history of the universe, which is of course no small feat and kind of absurd in a way, but certainly the idea that the known universe is now all at our fingertips is something that the internet has promised with its invention. As part of, sorry, my notes are sticking together. Um, she was an artist that was in residency at the Smithsonian uh, Museums. It's an artist research fellowship. And so what she did to make this work is she documented different museum um, collections, including natural specimens in the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. Her footage plays on a series of computer windows and folders that open and close, often one overlapping one another. And for me, this is really a kind of image of how we live today. This is exactly how our lives and our desktops look. It's an utterly familiar image to us all. I mentioned the score, which is just as important as the visual Im imagery. It also has a kind of collaged uh, feeling to it. The music is by the French electronic artist Joachim. The voice is by the Ghanaian American artist Aquateti or Akatatete. And the text is written in collaboration with the American poet Jacob Broomberg. So what I'm going to do now is show you a five minute clip of what's a 13 minute video. We're going to start it in the beginning. There should be sound to this. I don't know if um, you can hear me up in the booth, but there should be sound to this video. Let me see if I can do something about that. Um. Is there any way we can turn the sound on the video by chance? I know it was playing earlier when we did our sound check. No. All right, I'm not a tech person, but I'm gonna try. Oh, you'll help me? Thank you so much. <laughs> In the beginning, before all things, there was Amma, and he rested upon nothing. In the beginning, Ta, the demiurge, born from the essential ocean. In the beginning, the fa All right, I'm going to actually turn it back to the beginning, because um, I want you to really experience it. All right, here we go. In the beginning there was no earth, no water, nothing. There was a single hill called Nunachaha. In the beginning everything was dead. In the beginning there was nothing, nothing at all. No light, no life, no movement, no breath. In the beginning there was an immense unit of energy. In the beginning there was nothing but shadow and only darkness and water and the great god Bumba. In the beginning were quantum fluctuations. In the beginning the universe was a black egg where heaven and earth were mixed together. In the beginning there was an explosion. In the beginning a dark ocean washed on the shores of nothingness and licked the edges of night. In the beginning was the eternal night Han. In the beginning, before all things, there was Amma, and he rested upon nothing. In the beginning, Ta, the demiurge, born from the essential ocean. In the beginning, the fabric of space-time unfurled, it unflated. In the beginning, the atoms were formed. In the beginning, a giant cobra floated on the waters. In the beginning, everything was still. There was no beginning. In the beginning and in the void, the oldest of old gods was formed. 
The world had no time, no shape, and no life, except in the mind of the creator. In the beginning, the world already was. There was no world then, only the white, yellow, blue, black, silver, and red mists floating in the air. In the beginning was only the sky above, and water, and marshland below. In the beginning was nucleosynthesis, and when the universe became transparent to light, then the Milky Way took form. Then there was no need for light on Zambuling, for the gods emitted a pure light from their own bodies. Then the creator was in the form of a man without bones. Then the gravity of galaxies slowed the expansion of the universe. Then were units of matter. Then Pangu died and parts of his body became parts of the universe. Then there was recombination, local contraction. Then the supreme god of Ometeoto, being both masculine and feminine, spawned four children. Then Ra created his wife Hathor, with whom he had a son, Horus, who married Isis. Then Atum took his penis in hand to obtain the pleasure of orgasm thereby. Then Ayuasas was lady of the vulva and hand of God. Then Ogo introduced disorder into the world by committing incest with his mother earth. Then the first menstrual blood came from this union as well as Yeban and Andumbulu, the spirits of the underworld. And there was violent relaxation. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. Heart of sky only says the word earth. And the earth rises like the mist from sea. And Bumba vomited up the sun. And the sun dried up some of the water, leaving land. And when the earth was made, it fell down from the sky. Earth, hills, and stones all fell down from the sky. And the earth rose up like a mountain, and she used many colors of earth, which she mixed with saliva. And his spit was the oceans, and his phlegm was the earth. And denser elements sank to the earth's core. And the king above the sky said, punch the holes in the earth, the water will drain away. You'll have to see the rest at the museum. Yeah, it's pretty great. So for me, what this video does is speak to the avalanche of images and overload of information that we experience today. If the initial dream of the internet was one of universal knowledge and interconnectedness, what we see today is something of a burden. And now I'll quote the artist. She says, quote, to take on the whole history of humanity is already a burden. The burden of the history of the universe is absurd by definition. Fatigue is mentioned in a lot of creation myths. It's the loss of energy, the entropy principle, which is the founding principle of the creation of the universe." End quote. So gross fatigue in both its form and its content expresses the experience of image and information overload that, of course, is a hallmark of our times. And something that I've been thinking about with this work, especially as I'm seeing it over and over again, is also the way in which there's these primitivist narratives that seem to play out here. And the ethics of those narratives is something, I think, to further unpack and discuss. So another work that I think speaks to the reality of the internet today that is also an anchor of this first section, um, it really speaks to how artists perceive where the promise of the internet has landed today is work by this, uh, which is the one on the left, the screens on the left. Uh, Yes, on the left. Um, it's by a collective founded in 2013, How Do You Say Yam in African? They're also just known as the Yams Collective. Um, it's a collective of over 40 artists, musicians, poets, writers, performers, and activists, mostly black and mostly queer by their own definition. They all live all over the world and they collaborate together to make projects across many platforms and mediums. And the project that um, they made that we're showing in the exhibition is titled The Way Black Machine.net. 
And it's an installation that's comprised of 30 monitors. Um, they initially made it in 2014, but every time it gets shown, uh, the piece is updated. And it takes as its point of departure the shooting death of African-American teenager Michael Brown by the white Ferguson police officer Darren Wilson, and they construct an archive of activism around black embodiment. The title is a riff on the Wayback Machine, uh, which is a digital archive of the World Wide Web, and the work is composed of algorithmically generated, electronically processed images and materials that are mostly co collected from social media platforms, and they're drawing on various hashtags, including hashtag Black Lives Matter, hashtag Ferguson, among others, and they then include press and amateur footage, as well as statistical data on police police brutality and violence against African Americans. So let's take a look at how this work functions in the gallery. I'm gonna show you a very short clip of the piece, but before I do, I wanna let you know that there are depictions of racial violence that may be disturbing. The work brings up issues of the ethics of picturing violence against black bodies and how those images then circulate online. And it's a discussion I had with the artist and I look forward to unpacking that uh, more as well. So there's a little bit of sound with this piece, but I'm not gonna play it now. The sound really is the, the sound that emanates from these various clips that are kind of flashing on the 30 screens. Um, and there's a kind of 20 minute loop that this piece takes. At the end of the 20 minutes, all of the screens kind of fade to, um, to kind of like a gray static. And then that static has a pretty loud sound and actually kind of overtakes the galleries at some point. So for me, this work is, again, what we were talking about, the, the reality of the internet as opposed to the dream of it. And, you know, for me, I, I think about, and, and, and this piece really, I, I think, forces us to think about the fact that despite the proliferation of information about the systemic murder of African Americans at the hands of white law enforcement, despite the searing images that circulate widely on the internet, on the media, and on the news, um, despite this great visibility and access to these images and information, the needle on this issue hasn't changed. And the way blackmachine.net, the promise of the internet as a space of emancipation, is challenged by its more nefarious operations. And in the words of the artist, quote, examine the ways that memes and hashtags collapse and make legible such threats to personhood. Now this piece, although it's in the section uh, about networks of circulation, is a nice segue to the next section which is titled Hybrid Bodies. Um, because very much the, the kind of, uh, the ethics of the representation of the body at hand in this piece is also something that moves forward in this next section. And this next section really asks the age old question, what does it mean to be human? And this really remains critically important in the age of the internet and takes on, I would say, new urgency in today's technologically mediated sphere. The works in this section address the lasting effects of human activities on the health of the planet, uh, on both human and non-human life, the accelerated development of biotechnologies, robotics, and automation, and the human being as a basic unit of measurement and a structure of shared identity. In this section, the body itself is presented in multiple ways. It's an avatar in some cases, it's a digital representation, and most often it's a fragment comprising of both organic and sy synthetic materials. There's a lot of hybrids uh, in this section. And really in this section, we're confronting questions related to race, gender, and labor, among other questions. And these artworks together consider how our bodies are sites for politics in the digital age. So an anchor in this section is this monumental video sculpture by the American artist Judith Berry. The piece is titled Imagination Dead Imagine. It's from 1991. And Judith is what I've been calling oppression thinker, someone who's been making work, dealing with a lot of these ideas that are explored in the exhibition that are so resonant now, but she's been doing it since the 80s and 90s. And this is one such work. Um, Imagination Dead Imagine pictures the body as a hybrid. It's not quite human, but not machine either. What you see is a, a large head, and this sculpture is, uh, it's, it's about 12 feet tall, just to give you a sense of scale. So we see a head from all sides encased in a large cube. The head is projected on all 
four fi and five sides on the top as well. And it's almost like a human head is trapped in an old computer monitor or an old TV. The work was created during the height of the AIDS crisis in the United States, but to me feels utterly contemporary today and at home in today's era of omnipresent screens and swipes. Um, there's a soundtrack to this work, which is kind of heavy breathing. And what happens in the piece, and I'll just play you a video and talk over it, um, is that there's ambiguous substances that appear to be bodily fluids that are repeatedly poured over the head only to be wiped away. And the wipe, to me, from our vantage point, reads like a swipe, even though this piece was made long before tablets and smartphones. And so here you can see one of these substances which appears to look like blood, appears to be blood. And then at the top there you can see the, the wipe coming. So what's interesting to me is to, you know, one can think about this work uh, in the context in which it was made, which is against the backdrop of the AIDS crisis, and we see the body is being inundated with substances. The idea of in being infected by a virus is, of course, very present in this work. But today, the virus, uh, the idea of a virus or going viral has a whole nother resonance. And Barry have sa has said of this work, and now I'm quoting the artist, these images are electronically produced, defaced, and finally delivered clean, only to be sullied again. It leaves no uncertainty for the viewer that this head, while perhaps at first seemingly human, is in fact technologically generated. So for me, ultimately, this piece is a reckoning kind of a, of what it means, here's another substance, of, of what it means to be human in the digital age and, and feels like it could have been made yesterday, even, then, even though it was made almost 30 years ago. So this work um, of Judith Berry is juxtaposed with the work of an artist of a younger generation, uh, Josh Klein. The work is titled Saving Money with Subcontractors, and this demonstrates the wide-ranging effects of new technologies on our everyday lives. So to make this work, um, the artist scanned, modeled, and 3D printed a FedEx worker's body. This was his local FedEx delivery person um, that he developed a close relationship with. And of course, this piece has formal similarities with the Judith Berry. They're both cubes, uh, just to put it simply. And it's nice to kind of see them together, even though the scales are quite different. But what I would say what's really most interesting about this work is that it also deals with how technology has changed how we see our bodies in thinking about digital technology's effects on labor in the era of Amazon, FedEx, and other automated labor, automated labor of big retailers. So there's an accompanying video to this piece where the same FedEx worker talks about uh, his experience, and he's actually a subcontractor of FedEx, um, which means as a third-party contractor, he was regularly denied the full benefits of a salaried employee. So he doesn't have vacation days, he doesn't have health benefits, health insurance. Um, and so really it's about the effects of what it means to his work, his labor, and the effects on his body. Um, he even talks about how he has to buy his own um, uniform, special kind of shoes he has to wear so that he doesn't get, you know, back pain, et cetera, et cetera. So really because it becomes a kind of like physical scanning of the body. But this piece is also about how digital technologies have fundamentally changed portraiture and the idea of imaging the self and others. And so the artist sort of recalls the process of making this piece, and I'm quoting him now. He says, in 2014, I started doing 3D scans, which opened up a whole new world of photography for me. The way that they're created by compositing together scores of photos of a subject taken from different perspectives becomes a metaphor for how information about us is collected by companies and government agencies. Fractured aspects of our lives accumulating in different databases, creating subtly different portraits. And so here you see the portrait of, of one man, uh, de decapitated, uh, printed in three ways, one lifelike, and then 3D printed on uh, using the FedEx slip, and then 3D printed the head in the back is using the uniform, the blue of the FedEx uniform, and that's presented on peanuts that are also the likeness of the FedEx worker, and of course presented in a FedEx box. 
The next section is something um, we call virtual worlds, which is all about how artists see cyberspace as a vital space of invention. Even before the invention of the World Wide Web, cyberspace was something we imagined as expansive, immaterial, an environment that was flexible enough to accommodate a multitude of virtual worlds. Artists in this section engage in complicated relationships between the virtual and the real in a variety of different ways, exploring the possibilities of computer-generated spaces as sites of production, of inquiry, even as they mark the increasingly indistinguishable difference between the virtual and the real in everyday life. And for me, a kind of huge anchor, not just of, of this section, but of the show, is a collaborative project that was made by, the, by two French artists, Pierre Huyghe and Philippe Pereno, in 1999. And the piece was titled No Ghost, Just a Shell. It's a big project. Uh, the title is a reference to the Japanese manga film Ghost in a Shell, which you may recall recently in the last couple of years was remade as a Hollywood film. So in 1999, the artist purchased a Japanese manga character that was named Anne Lee, and Huig and Pereno used the original Anne Lee computer file as a starting point for an extended project. They invited several artists to appropriate the character and to bring her to life. Some of the artists that they invited to make projects with Anne Lee include Liam Gillick, Dom uh, Dominique gonzalez Forrest, and Rikret Teravanesia. Huig and Pereno suggested to the participating artists, quote, Work with her in a real story, translate her capabilities into psychological traits, lend her a character, a text, a denunciation, an address to the court, a trial in her defense. Do all that you can do so this character lives different stories and experiences, so that she can act as a sign, as a live logo. The artists have filled Anley's empty shell with these ideas, manifested in the form of animations, paintings, posters, books, neon works, and sculptures. So in the exhibition, we have two of these uh, projects. There were 14 total. Um, the first, what you see here, is the video which was made uh, by Huig, titled One Million Kingdoms. And then that video is projected on a series of posters by the uh, French design firm MM Paris that portrays Anne Lee in a kind of collaged uh, wheat paper wheat paper poster um, uh, set of images. And so I'm gonna show you a video of Huig's uh, One Million Kingdoms. It's just a short clip and you'll see that he portrayed Anne Lee in a barren computer generated kind of lunar landscape and the accompanying soundtrack is a recording of Neil Armstrong's first moon landing. So this is the still and I'll play you the video just a few minutes of that. the line. It's there, at the foot of the volcano, that the moon landing tests were filmed. foreshadowed us what we would discover later on. They prepare us for the spectacle of desolation. On the moon there is nothing Besides dust.
the conquest of space, which was a dream until now, had become an illusion. We want to enter the unknown when the greatest mysteries are right here, here under our footsteps. We are on the threshold of another world, just one small step. So I think you probably know what comes after that, one small step. But it's pretty interesting to hear that audio and, and uh, think about it in terms actually of the internet, this idea of a kind of unknown launch into an unknown world. Um, what's interesting about this project is its conclusion. In 2002, Huig and Pereno created a corporation in Anne Lee's name. They sold her copyright to that corporation so that she might own her own rights to representation. This gesture, which was a culmination of their project to quote in their words, free a sign from the realm of representation, and really provokes questions about legal personhood, agency, and the politics of, rep politics of representation. And for me, what's pretty incredible is that they did this in 1999. It was an incredible, incredibly important signpost um, for things to come. And you know, even looking at what at that time was really um, sophisticated looking visuals, and now of course to us looks extremely simple, the ideas and the kind of conceptual framework of this to me still seems very much ahead of its time actually. So as I've been saying all along, the show's not just a show of video and digital technologies. A variety of mediums have been touched by the internet, including the oldest medium of all, which is painting. This is an untitled painting by the Bronx-based artist Avery Singer. And to make this work, she uses 3D technology. She uses SketchUp. And she renders the composition on her computer before she then executes the painting by hand. She describes her process like this, quote, I utilize computer modeling as a means to set up a kind of digital still life. I take the basic information that a selected still from each model gives me as a point of departure. So in this painting, you see a geometric um, figure, a likely a female figure that studies a film strip with the two frames isolated and magnified showing instances of movement paused in the space of a static painting. She tests the representational capabilities of the software while also expanding the possibilities of painting in the digital age. Uh, the second to last section is titled States of Surveillance, and really we can't think about the internet um, today without thinking about threat to privacy and surveillance. And this is really a very central theme that runs through the show, not just in the section, as you've seen many of the other works that we talked about have this kind of undertone of sort of uh, thinking about surveillance today. So there are really two kind of events in a way that we thought a lot about in, think, in forming this section. Um, one was the revelations of Edward Snowden in 2013 of the mass um, kind of surveillance program of the National Security, the NSA, National Security Agency, um, and really thinking about debates around governmental transparency, mass surveillance, and information privacy. But two years before Snowden's disclosures, the Arab world experienced democratic revolutions in the spring of 2011, known as the Arab Springs. Um, and that, for us, was also really important in thinking about this, because the use of social media platforms, along with other digital technologies, offered a means of collective activism to subvert state-operated media channels. These two episodes are unique and complex examples, among many others, that reflect on the dualistic nature of the internet um, and especially thinking about its utopian ideals and perhaps its dystopian realities. So the artworks in this section employ a variety of strategies to examine the wide-reaching effects of surveillance, um, ideas about information and control, while also pointing to paths of resistance. So a kind of anchor in this piece is by Rafael Lozano Hemmer, who I understood um, has been a lecturer in this series, a Mexican artist based in Montreal. Um, this is a piece that he made in 1992 titled Surface Tension. 
And he made it uh, at that time as a response to the rise of smart bomb technologies, which used uh, camera technologies, infrared camera technologies, um, to aid them in their, um, in their mission. Uh, and this was during the first Gulf War. Um, and here what he's done is uses infrared technology as an interactive part of the installation in which a human eye is programmed to follow viewers throughout the space. So it's quite literally Big Brother watching you, and here's a video of how it works. Um, so there's someone now walking across the gallery. We can't see them because who, who, you know, the person filming this didn't film the person walking across. And that eye tracks you in the gallery wherever you go. So um, quite literally, it's Big Brother. And and this is you know a, peop a work that people immediately get and works symbolically in many ways. Um, he actually tweaked the piece in 2004, so he initially made it in 1992, tweaked it in 2004, because as the artist said, uh, he wanted to quote the work to coincide with George W. Bush's new war in the Gulf and the increased surveillance of his own people. So surface tension really implicates the viewer in a real-time system of watching and being watched, pointing to the often unseen role of surveillance in everyday life. And one of the things that I really like about this piece is when there's no one in the gallery, the eye closes and goes to sleep. But it's always there, ever, ever ready, just like Alexa. <laughs> so one of the issues we confront in this exhibition and in this section in particular is that access to the internet is not equal for everyone. Um, I think here in the US and in the West, you know, we kind of take that for granted, but in fact many people across the world don't have access to the internet. Actually more people than not don't have access to the internet. And there are many areas of the world where the internet is restricted by regimes and governments. And in this case, the internet could also lead to a path of resistance, and we were interested in teasing that out, and that's especially teased out with this work. So what we saw, for example, in the Arab Spring is a sense of, uh, is the liberation that was afforded through uh, social media and citizen, uh, jur uh, citizen journalism. And so this piece, which is titled The Fall of a Hair Blow-Ups, is made by a Lebanese artist, Rabia Mrue, and it was made during the first year of the Syrian Civil War. And it's a series of seven photographs, um, and what they portray, they're enlarged, blurry images of snipers that are pointing a gun towards the photographer, and thus the viewer. These images were captured by Syrian protesters on mobile phone cameras, and they were uploaded online. Some of these people who uh, made the pictures were reportedly killed moments after uh, photographing the gunman. These cell phone pictures were uploaded freely, available freely, um, and you know these kind of images have played a pivotal role in documenting on the ground reality of the Syrian civil war and other Arab Spring uprisings. And the artist has said of this work, quote, what distinguishes the revolution in Syria more than any other Arab country is that in Syria, journalists, whether professionals or freelancers, whether they belong to an institution or not, are entirely absent from the scene of the event. This makes it almost impossible to know what is happening during the demonstrations. There are only two ways for us to know what is going on there, one being Syria's official news channels, and the other being the protester images, which are uploaded onto the internet. I chose the second source, the internet, since my aim is to look for the protesters' point of view. Now, of course, this was said during the first year of the Sy Syrian civil war. A lot has happened since, uh, including a kind of uh, clamping down and a complete destruction of a society um, and uh, any kind of social fabric. Um, of course, today we can't think about the internet without thinking about social media and the ways in which te those technologies have influenced how we think about our many selves. And in fact, I would say the rise of social media has underscored the malleability of the self, which of course was always there. So the final section in this exhibition is titled Performing the Self. It looks at how the internet has affected how we understand ourselves, how we perform our identities online and offline, and increasingly um, how that has affected who, how we think of ourselves as a society. Many online platforms offer unique means with which to explore and articulate aspects of our personal and cultural identities that may not 
otherwise be easily expressed. So while we may think a lot about the drawbacks of social media, online platforms and technologies can also offer new modes of representation, a sense of community and increased visibility for historically marginalized groups. So the artworks in the section kind of explore both. Uh, the sort of surface of the performativity of, you know, the online social media presence, um, as well as perhaps other um, ways in which representation and thinking about the self and the malleability of the self um, has had far-reaching effects, um, both online and offline. So in this section, there's a really interesting conversation between two artworks, um, and you can see two of the, them here sort of in conversation with each other, and those were sort of the anchors of this section from the very beginning. And those are photographs by the artist Juliana Huxtable and a sculpture of Huxtable by the artist Frank Benson. And I'm really excited that you'll be able to hear from Juliana herself um, when she comes here next month. So you probably know um, Juliana best as a performer and a DJ. She's also a visual artist, makes um, is a poet. Um, she works really across a range of platforms to push against and stabilize the restrictive boundaries traditionally assigned to categories such as gender and ethnicity. Juliana is a trans woman. For many years, she, has, uh, she operated a really influential Tumblr account where she uploaded many self-portraits, and she explains, quote, my adulthood was liberated by social media. It became as integral to myself sense of self and psychological reality as my flesh. At this point, I feel like I'm always living a hybrid of my online presence and my IRL presence. I used to feel a bit powerless, and it was actually through playing with my body as an image file that could be manipulated, distorted, rendered, decorated, and placed in new context that I came to accept and feel at home in my body as it currently is, but also to imagine how it might move into the future. So here you see a self-portrait uh, uh, untitled In the Rage, and she uh, portrays herself as a self-described, in her words, quote, cyber, cunt, priestess, witch, and Nubian princess. And in the second photograph that's included uh, in the exhibition, she creates a pro provocative visual poem that comprises a, a variety of references to various places, people, and cultural signifiers that relate to African-American identity. So throughout much of her work, the internet is a tool for the writing and rewriting of various histories, and thus a tool for constructing and deconstructing identity. So Frank Benson's sculpture, Juliana, is a life-size bronze sculpture that was made with the aid of 3D printing technology and captures Huxtable in exquisite detail. He first actually came to know Huxtable through her Tumblr account, um, which really was an inspiration for the pose and, and the way that this piece looks, the finishing of the piece, the color of the paint. Eventually, the two of them were introduced by a mutual friend, and they made, collaborated really closely to make this work. So to make this work, he scanned Juliana in 3D. He had her 3D printed. Then those 3D prints were used to make casts that eventually, eventually were made uh, into a bronze. And as, as you know, bronze is a very traditional material for, for sculpture. So starting in the very present as a way to look back at the history of sculpture. This piece is incredibly lifelike. It's hyper real, I would say. Um, and to be in its presence physically is really quite a powerful thing. So I encourage all of you to really spend some time with it in person. The work was influenced by Huxtable's own self-portraits and desire on how to be portrayed. For example, Benson finished the sculpture with a metallic green paint, it's an auto body paint, um, that was inspired by the self-portrait that's in the show. Uh, it's right next to the sculpture, so it gives this kind of uh, conversation between the two. But that paint gives the classic bronze sculpture a digital, a really machine-like finish. Um, it's this kind of hyper-realism and the detail of Juliana, the way in which it's rendered, is really uh, presents Juliana uh, as an ideal. Her pose, this, this pose here, is, uh, makes reference to classical representations of the female body throughout the history of art and history of sculpture. And for Benson, the 3D modeling technology and its existence in the digital space is on par with the physically rendered sculpture. He explains, and I quote him now, I want the sculpture to exist as a completely finished entity inside the computer. 
the 3D model is its ultimate version, and the print in the real world is a manifestation of it. So he holds the kind of uh, digital file in, in the same sort of regard or level as the bronze. Um, this work was first shown in 2015 at the New Museum in New York, and the, uh, the sculptor became a social media phenomenon and an icon for some in the trans community. It became a uh, kind of trend on social media and to this date if you do a search of uh, hashtag Juliana Huxtable this sculpture comes up uh, alongside obviously images of her and performing um, and so this is what I love about this work that it really becomes full circle it began as a digital image a 3d scan it was translated into bronze a kind of heaviest most you know kind of fraught material of all and then it went back into the digital realm via social media and this is emblematic of how circulated images can have immense power. So before we end, I want to just take a moment to look back um, at the exhibition uh, as I've had a little bit of a moment to, to get some perspective, to have some distance. Um, I would like to express that this exhibition is not the final word. As in the case of many exhibitions, especially thematic exhibitions, uh, art in the age of the internet is an incomplete account. It's dated as soon as it's you know, put on view. So the project aspires to being neither the first or the last word. Um, I really just consider this as a kind of signpost, a bookmark, a link to ongoing conversations that have proceeded and will, will follow this endeavor. The book, which um, is its own major endeavor, is the scholarly output of this project and one that I hope will live on beyond the ephemerality of the exhibition. And with the book, we invited authors to write beyond the parameters of the exhibition to look back at the 1960s. And we also included conversations with artists of many different generations so that their voices would be present um, as well. If the internet has taught us anything is that the pace by which information, knowledge, and how we understand our world is always changing, it's never fixed, it's ever variable. And so from the outset of this research project in 2015 to its presentation in 2018, technologies, conditions, and visual cultures have changed seismically, but also the world has changed. Since I started on this project, we witnessed Brexit, uh, the election of Donald Trump, the rise of hashtags and movements such as Me Too and Black Lives Matter, the rise of fake news, post-truth, and of course the increased threat to net neutrality. And I have to say, many of this, these events sharpened the arguments of the exhibition. I was writing my catalog essay in 2016 when post-truth was announced as the word of the year by the Oxford English Dictionaries. It was also the year of Brexit, or the referendum on Brexit, Brexit and the election of Donald Trump. And with those events, along with others, I took a more pointed and critical look at where the internet has brought us. I think, um, you know, for me, the exhibition is a way to kind of mark our moment, to step back and understand the complex moment in which we live. But I think these concepts will look very different to us in three years, five years, and ten years from now. And I'm sure that artists are, as we speak, making work that are shifting some of these ideas. So in this ever-present ever-changing present, where everything seems to be shifting with incredible speed, I think visual culture does more than hold a mirror to reality. It actually has a role in creating it. If there's anything that I hope you can take away from this exhibition is that art and artists play a key role in shedding light on, being critical of, and asking probing questions about our moment, the age of the internet. Um, I would like to remind you that there's a Q&A in the screening room um, just down the hallway. Um, but before you go, I want to take a picture of all of you for my Instagram. Um, I wonder if the house lights can be pulled up. Thank you. Wave, smile. Thank you so much for coming. Have a good night.